I know you won't. So get out the previous one. Oh no, you wouldn't have had it because that was the quiz. So yeah. Richard, let's focus on the math, please. I ask you guys to be quiet. I still haven't heard quiet. All right, no, we're, we're, we gotta get concentrated on the math here, so no more questions. Um, I always show that to kids, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's nothing to be worried about. Um, if you're around a lot of uh, rats or uh, in the Southwest, it's not necessarily the rats or the mice. It's the, um, I believe the, the, the black plague is in the uh, prairie dogs. So they have a, a major carrier of those. And most people don't hang around prairie dogs. There's also a, a more dangerous one that you're more likely to encounter in Colorado. It's called the Hunter virus. Uh, that's also kill you as, as well. Hunter virus is called. No, that was Black Death right there. What we were just looking at. All right, questions on the homework. On the homework. No. Okay, put your hand down there. All right. Yes. Make sure they get turned in. No questions on the homework? You were okay with that table? Okay, cool, because period one was not. Yes. Uh, question on the math, that's all we're talking about. All right, 341. All right, here we go, check your work. Uh, questions one through four, you had to draw the pictures, so I will look at your pictures. Laura, get your homework out, let's go. Question number five, plugging the values into the formula would result in seven plus seven minus 12 equals two. Seven faces, seven vertices, 12 edges, that equals two. Number six, plugging the values into the formula, eight plus 12 minus 18 equals two. Eight faces, 12 vertices, 18 edges, that equals two. The house. Right, technically that is a pentagonal prism. Uh, it would be seven plus 10 minus 15 equals two. Number eight looks like stairs. We don't have a name for that one. Uh, that's a composite polyhedron made up of two rectangular prisms put together. Uh, that would be eight plus 12 minus 18 equals two. The table, which none of you had questions on. Uh, I'm gonna read it from left to right, each, each number. So for number nine, it would be six edges, four vertices, F plus V would be eight, and E plus two would be eight as well. Number 10, straight across, 12, eight, 14, 14. Did you do any of the homework? I tried to, but I couldn't get the time. Number 11, 12, six, 14, 14. Number 12, 30, 20, 32, 32. And the last one, number 13, 20, I'm sorry, 30, 12, 32, 32. Make sure your names are on those, pass those to the left, pass them to the left. Hey, no time to start talking, just pass them to the left. Paul Heaton. With sides of rectangles. <laughs> as long as the sides are rectangles and there's still the other ones. All right. We will be adding to the formulas today. We'll be adding to the formulas today. That's a lot of this paper here. All right, do I have all the homework now? Is this all the homework? Oh, wait, what? I swear I saw I don't know. You should look at the homework. I all right. So, big picture. Today we will be calculating volume. Okay, volume of various shapes. Okay, volume of various shapes. 
What did we do yesterday in class? Three. Therefore, we'll be doing the same thing today. All right. Does everybody have uh, their homework copy down? One through ten, all. Page 344, 345. We will get two formulas today. Two formulas. Two formulas. Your fish would die. There's no way to feed you. The water would pour out. <laughs> Your fish would still die. Wow. Yay. My fish died because it touched it. That means it's hard. No, this, it, this is, there's not a lot of it. It's pretty simple. Because usually when there's like, a, like no, I agree. I agree, but not, not this big. Notice if I make it all, it's because they didn't give me that many practice problems. And I mean, if it's evens, that means there's plenty of practice problems. When I say all, it's that there's not that many practice problems. This is maybe 10 minutes worth of work. 15 for me, I'm stupid. 19, 20. All right, here we go. So, yes, we're going to be doing the same thing we did on the previous day, which is we're mess messing around with uh, three-dimensional shapes. Uh, the ones that we'll be dealing with this year are this one, which we haven't talked about yet. This one and this one are basically the shape, the same shape or the same type of shape. They look nothing alike. However, they have sides that are okay. rectangles. These are your prisms. And then lastly, we have this shape, the pyramid. The sides are not rectangles. The sides are triangles. Okay. Uh, the box is a form of a prism. Okay. All right, we started this chapter talking about area, area of a rectangle uh, in a parallelogram. There's my rectangle, length times width, my parallelogram, base times height. Uh, then we moved on to the triangle, one half base times height. Okay, that was my formula. We have five of these total. Uh, we moved on to the most complicated one, the trapezoid. That was the big, long, ugly formula. And we finished up for area with a circle pi r squared. Those were the five formulas that you're already taking your quiz on. Okay. We move on to three-dimensional shapes. We will have a bunch of them. We will get more formulas. So we will add to these five formulas. Remember, we also had a couple formulas for perimeter as well, too. We we'll also recall we did area. We took a shape and we filled it full of squares, which is why the units, when you do area, are called square units, okay? Because you're literally filling a shape full of squares. But now we're going to be three dimensions. So we're not filling it full of squares. We're going to fill it full of cubes, right? We're going to take a three dimensional shape, fill it full of cubes and do the same process, count them. Except that is way too complicated. So we found out that there was an easier way. We figured out there were formulas. We will do the same thing for three dimensions. Yes, we're going to fill the shape full of cubes, but we will have formulas for it. Richard? Um, when you write the answer, to a 3D shape, isn't it? Centimeters. Uh, to the third power, that means yeah. cube, right? Okay, so, and literally that is this slide right here. Uh, how much space is in a 3D shape? Write that as box number one, that is your first definition, okay? Volume is the amount of space in a three-dimensional figure. And as Richard just asked, we will measure volume in cubic units. So in other words, you write the units, and you put it to the third power. Why does three end up being a cube? Because remember, a cube has three dimensions, and all three dimensions have exactly the same value for a cube. That means all sides are the same. Okay. You can also, if you really don't like yourself and you want to make it as hard as possible, write the word cubic and then the word units. But most people, Myself included, just say, that's too much to write. I'm just going to put it to the third power. But you can certainly write the words. And you will see the word problems. They will say cubic, whatever the units are. Or even meters cubed. We OK? We're going to get two formulas today, just two. Yes? Yeah, you need Euler's formula on your resource card. Uh, am I going to question you on uh, what's the shape? Yes, so that might want to go on there as well too. I'll just say I'm not going to 
ask you what a icosahedron is, but I certainly am gonna ask you what a prism is, uh, rectangular and triangular. But trust me when I say we're gonna do this so many times that you will have it memorized. Okay, so for those of you that are more visual, here's this idea of taking a shape, filling it full of cubes, and then we count how many cubes there are to find the volume of it, okay? We never actually did this for area. We won't actually do this for volume, but this is the idea behind why are the units cubic for volume and squared for uh, area. All right, so today's class, we're gonna be doing prisms. Here are our two types of prisms. We got this prism right here, and we have this prism right here. So tent and box, right? Uh, this is not called a tent, it's called a triangular prism. Remember, the sides of all prisms are rectangles. The tent, right, right, our triangular prism looks all, a lot like this one, but this one doesn't have sides of rectangles, it has sides of triangles. All the sides here are triangles. All the sides on this one are rectangles and squares in this particular case. So we will be doing this shape and this shape. We're going to get a formula for this one. This is the hard one. And then we're going to get one for this one. This is the easy one. Okay. All right. So volume of prisms, volume of prisms. My technology has been cranky on me today. So rectangular prism, triangular prism. I do want to point out the purpose of this slide is that, look at me, triangular prism, yes? If I turn it sideways, did I change it? No. Same darn thing, so it's still a triangular prism. Occasionally, this is the one that causes some students to think pyramid. I don't know why. It doesn't look like a pyramid to me, but it's a triangular prism. All right. So those are the two shapes that we'll be doing and we will be getting formulas. The good news is that there's a formula. The bad news is there's a formula. So we already got five, here's two more, seven of them to remember. Or to not forget to put on your resource card. As always, two things, resource card calculator. And then the second thing is, what's the shape? What's the formula? Plug in the numbers, do the calculations. Uh, did I hand back the quizzes yet? No, no. When I hand back the quizzes, every single year it happens. There's kids that literally write the right formula, plug in the numbers, and then something goes wrong with their calculator. Other kids don't identify the shape. They put the wrong formula. I can't help them. The whole thing's wrong. Okay. But for the kid that says, well, it's a uh, square, and here's the form for area, and here are the numbers plugged in, and then something goes wrong with the calculator, at least I can give that kid a few points for trying. The kid that looks at the square and says trapezoid, which some of you did, <laughs> right? I can't give you any help. You're clueless, you're lost, right? Someone saw rectangle and wrote trapezoid and put the formula for trapezoid. Some people saw trapezoid and saw triangle. That person was probably me. Right? All right. So here is the idea for rectangular prisms. You ready? And it's why these shapes all have one side that is colored. See the colored shape? If I ask you right now to tell me the name of that shape, that's a rectangle. Okay, do we have a formula for area of a rectangle? Yes. If I ask you that formula, you would tell me? Or link times width, right? So now if I asked you all to grab a piece, don't do it, grab a piece of paper and to cut that shape out. And let's say there was a hundred people here and I collected those hundred rectangles and I stack them up, guess what shape you would make? Um, you would make this shape right here. That's the idea of where this formula comes from. It comes from the fact that the, we will call this the base <coughs> is a rectangle. And if I don't make one of these, but I make hundreds of them and stack them up, you recreate this shape. That's where the formula comes from. We call it, when it's stacked, we call it the height of the prism. So the height of the prism is how many of these shapes are stacked upon each other. The base is the, well, whatever it is, triangle or in this case, a rectangle. We stack them up, that's the height of it, and that's how we're gonna to get to our formula. <coughs> Excuse me, the formula is base area, whatever the shape is, triangle or rectangle, times how many, how, how many rectangles do we have stacked on each other? It's like a stack of pancakes, except the pancakes are rectangles in this case. Or pizzas. Mm -hmm. or, or, or excuse me, or pizzas in this case. 
Um, this also works. And by the way, don't write this down. This is the formula that's in the book. Capital B times A's. That means the base area times the height. It gives you the same formula for this shape as it does for this shape. Well, they're both prisms. So in your book and you look it up and it says, what's the form for volume of a prism? It says capital BH. All it means is take the bottom, the base in this case, calculate the area and then stack those triangles one upon the other until you Which get to the, the top. Height. That's the height, okay? Exactly, okay. okay? But they will give you that value. It will be listed right here. It'll say the height of the prism is, you know, 10 centimeters. Oh, Laura, please stop. So here we have a conundrum, a problem. This is the formula. By the way, it's the only formula in the book. This is not a very useful formula. So what we will do right now once, remember it, but we will use the more useful formula that we'll talk about here in a second. Okay, so write it down one time. This is for any prism, for any prism, pentagonal, octagonal, rectangular, triangular, it's capital B times H, where capital B stands for the area of the base and H stands for the height of the base. That's the distance between the two bases. So here's my triangular prism. The bases are the triangles, the distance between, that means how many triangles are stacked up, that's your height. Looking, 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 who handed out sheets? Did I do that? Yes, I did. Yeah. And I would have put the extra ones. Put them over here. Could you grab one for Sarai? Thanks. All right, I said we would write this down once and then, well, not necessarily forget about it, but we're not going to use it. Okay, why? It's not useful. What number means B? There's a no number. It's base area. That means you got to calculate that area. So we will write the two formulas, one for triangular, one for rectangle, right? One box at a time. All right, so let's do that. Don't write that down. That's what it says in the book. Doesn't matter what type of prism you got, it's capital BH. Let's do the first one. Uh, the first one is the rectangular prism. And I said the rectangular prism is a bunch of rectangles stacked up on each other. Well, okay, if the bottom or the base is a rectangle, what's the form for air to rectangle? How about length times width? Okay, okay, well, that would be the B, right? So our B is gonna turn into length times width. Well, times the height, you're done. So that in yellow is the formula that you're actually gonna use. Write that one down, box three. If it's this thing, the box, rectangular prism, that's the formula we're gonna use. Three numbers multiplied together. Oh boy, that one's not too challenging. Length times width times height. Be careful, the length and the width come from the base. Look at me. You see the, you see the base? Where is it right now? Where is it now? Is it still the base? Yes. No. This is our problem, child. Remember I said that yesterday. Why? Because all the sides are not the same. They're all rectangles. It's a cubit would be the same, right? So the bottom on a rectangular prism can always be the base. It doesn't have to be, in this case, the red one. But it can be if you want it. Just remember, height is the distance between the two opposite bases. So if you want to use that as your base and it's turned like this, then the distance between my two hands here, that is the, that is the height, not how tall it is left and right. But if I turn it this way, now it literally is how tall it is is your height. Who's confused on that? Said so these are the problem childs. Okay. Did I say childs? Yeah, you said Okay. All right. I can't make this complicated because it's not complicated. Step number one, what's the shape? Uh, rectangular prism. Uh, step number two, what's the formula? Uh, Oh, length times width times height. The book will always say, no, they will always say capital B times H. Well, that's not very useful. The, the more useful one is length times width times height. Well, the length and the width come from the base. So the length and the width are three and four, and the height is 10. There's only going to be three numbers there. I can't make this one very confusing. Okay. But it is length times width times height. Now, 
let's put on a thing. Oh, by the way, what's the answer? 100 what? 120. Now, if you had to do this by hand, remember multiplication is commutative. You can multiply in any order you want. 4 times 10? 20. Times 3? 3 times 4? 12. Times 10? It doesn't matter, right? We got the same answer. Uh, remember, it's in uh, cubic units because we're doing volume. Now, let's put our thinking cap. Here are three different numbers, yes? yes? Will it always be three different numbers for a rectangular prism? No. What else could it be? Can't be four numbers. Two. Uh, could be two if the base is a a square. It also could be if it's a if it's a cube, right? You, you do better work when your eyes are closed. Right. Um, yeah, if it's a cube, you're only going to have one number. Now, I, I want you to make sure I only listed three numbers here, but remember, there's there's lots of edges. There's 12 edges there. If they listed all of the numbers, there would be 12 numbers here. Not 12 different numbers, but 12 numbers. Are you with me? Yes. Right? Because if this side is three, this side is three. That side's four, that's five. If that side's Ooh. 10, that side's 10, mm -hmm. that side's 10, that side's Can 10. Can you send Jake Gunter down, please? He's on his way. And then you would have three, four, three, four on the bottom. You could have 12 numbers floating around. Not 12 different numbers. There's only three different numbers here. And as we said before, if it's a square prism, you'll have two numbers. You might have 12 total numbers. I've never seen one where they list all 12 numbers. But you'd have two different numbers if it's square. And if it's a cube, you might have 12 numbers, but they're all the same number. Okay? Those are the only three possibilities that can happen with a rectangular prism. So go ahead. <laughs> exactly. This is why I give me 20 of these for homework, right? Now, you open up your book, they will always have this formula. If you take the state test, you take the SAT test, the PSAT in high school, they will give you a formula sheet. When it says rectangular prism, or, or sorry, when it says prism, it'll just say capital BH. You're like, well, thank you for nothing, right? Uh, you have to remember that it's base area times height. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. I believe it's after spring break. Uh, yeah, and you. Uh, Carson's in, mother is the one that's out. setting it up. So. It's not going to really count for a state funding or anything. So mm -hmm. it's completely optional. Not for for really high school option. students, we recommend that they absolutely they take it because it's a practice SAT test. Wait, it's an optional? It's optional. It's, it's, you it's don't always know. optional. I mean, yes. This, this year. Uh, no, it's always optional. I know, can but this year it's not going to count for anything right. of the state funding. So. Right. It, it would be basically worth. All right, it's not worth this in the sense of you get it. Uh, you, if you are moving to a new area, you want to know is it a good school or a bad school? Where do you do? You ask friends, or you look at their state scores. Right, it's a pretty known fact that if the state scores are poor, then it's probably not that great of a school. Right, if the scores are high, then it's probably a pretty good school. Not not universally guaranteed, uh, but that's generally what happens. So it's not that we say don't ever take the test. On a regular year, we encourage it, right? Give it to me before you're in trouble. I'll make another one. I mean, um, <laughs> you mean you'll talk to the dean another time? I guess. All right. Some other time. Okay. All right. Uh, well, as I was talking, what's the answer here? Um, what's the answer? <laughs> Step one, what's the shape? Nathan, put it down. Talk to me. What's the shape? It's not a cube. Okay, what's the formula? Plug in the numbers. Do the math. Now you literally can use the calculator that's in your hand, my friend. Uh, by the way, that's not that hard to do in your head. That's just, what, 32 times 7? Yeah, 2 times 7, Maddie? Oh, okay. Four carry one. Three times seven is twenty-one. Plus one is twenty-two. So what? Two twenty-four. All right. Hey, so many times when I say you can use a calculator, all of a sudden the brain power in the room shrinks because you're like, I don't know what two times three times four is. As soon as I put a calculator in your hand. All of a sudden, you're unwilling to, on easy math, even try it. Okay? Don't have a have a case of the calculator stupidness. 
right? Simply because I allow you to have a calculator in your hand. Okay. All right, rectangular prisms, questions. All right, do box five all by yourself. You have 10 seconds. You're the one that told me it was easy. It's 48 centimeters. A little square. A little square, yeah. I write it out. No. No. It's 48. Right. Yes. Area is always squared, but volume, what we're doing here is always cubed. So the answer here, time is up. Uh, 78 cubic centimeters or centimeters cubed. Okay. I write it out because. Some people like to write it out. That's fine. I just find that just way too much writing to do. So I just say, put to the third power. 75. It won't be the same for the triangular prism. But for this one, yeah, it is literally this easy. All right, moving on. Moving on. Click, are you? So I did that one for no reason. Next shape, you ready? This is the one, I call this the problem child only because as soon as I flip it and turn it, kids will make a mistake. This one actually causes true problems no matter what the student. So this one, the triangular prism, the tent here, this one causes problems. And I'm going to try to help you, but you got to stay with me and put some effort into it. So here we go. So the next one is the triangular prism. Well, it's a prism. So the formula is V is equal to capital BH. Not very helpful. But if instead we think about it as triangles that have been stacked one upon each other, we can come up with a formula. What's the shape? Triangle. What's the shape? Triangle. What's the form for area of a triangle? Base no. Oh, uh, area. What's the form for area of a triangle? Oh, he yeah. said base times height, and I said no. Length times width. Length times width. There is no length and width on a triangle. Length 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 length. Is that what you're going to say, Neonius? Okay. For those of you that remembered, oh, that's a good idea. Hey, it only took us, what, three days to forget area of a triangle? We took the quiz on Friday, and we've already forgotten it by Tuesday. Okay? That is a, a pretty good indicator of you better have these things on a resource card. Okay? All right, Connor, put that away. Um, yeah, area of a triangle is one half base times side or base times side divided by two. And then if we think about it, it's a prism, it's triangles stacked upon each other. We come to the problem. The problem is this. What was the formula? Base times height divided by two. Okay, base times what? Height. height. Then we have to calculate the, the height of the prism. So we have two H's that are kind of floating around. Where do the two H's come from? Well, they come from the fact that you have a height for the triangle. That's the blue part. And then you have a height for the prism. That's two H's in one formula. They're not the same H. They're two different H's. That is a problem. Okay. So, but the formula, right? Not the one we're going to use. Base area is a triangle. We put it together and we do the calculation. Well, base area is, is one half base times height times the height of the prism. We have two H's floating around. That's too complicated. I don't know what either H means. So we write it out what each thing means. We're going to use sub notation, subscript, right? We're going to use script that goes underneath each letter. Doesn't mean abstract, multiply, divide. It's just the name of it to write it out in yellow. Write this down box. What are we on? Seven. This is the formula Holy for crap. volume of a triangular prism. It's not as long as it looks like. In fact, I made it shorter because instead of writing the word triangle, I put TRI. So it's one half times the base of the triangle times the height of the triangle times the height of the prism. It's still three numbers multiplied together divided by two. It is easy. The issue is the two H's. The issue is finding the base and the height of the triangle. It's not going to be a triangle floating there all by itself. It's going to be this ugly shape. And remember yesterday we talked about how your eyeball can flip things around on you. So that's what you got to deal with. But the formula itself is one half base of the triangle times height of the triangle times height of the prism. Who does not have that copy down? Let's see how this works out. Do you see the shape? What's the shape? Triangular. 
Where do you see a square? In the bottom. The whole That's thing. Nice. The whole thing. It's a tent, and a tent is called a triangular prism. All right. I do see a square. The square is actually going to help ourselves. We're not using that formula. We're using that formula. Watch me. You ready? Your, hold on. Your eye should immediately go to the triangle. I made mine blue. Yours will not be blue. Do you see the blue? Yeah. You don't see blue? I, 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 do. I, I don't see blue. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Right like, it's light blue. Okay. Not worried. okay. Don't look at the whole shape. Look at one of the triangles. Some students uh, might want to, I don't know, outline the triangle to help them out. So if you outline the triangle, you're looking at just the triangle. You ready? The first part of the, the, the uh, formula says, look at the triangle. I need the base and the height of the triangle. So I made it blue. I outlined it, whatever. My eyeball now goes to the square. Do you see the square of the triangle? Do you see the square of the triangle? Right here. Remember, the height of a triangle is the perpendicular distance between the base and the opposite vertex. Why can't they just draw? Because it has to be a square. Because how far is it between here and here? How are you going to measure that? Okay. That's why it has to be a square because it's 90 degrees. That thing right there means 90 degrees because otherwise I would be allowed to measure it any way I want. We measure a distance between two objects perpendicularly. Because a square has how many angles? And each one is, which is 90. That's why the square is there. Why don't they just draw straight lines? They're because how do you know it's straight? No, it's not straight. geometry. You can't look at it. You have to have indicators. Honest. You have to have it. Yes, but you look at the indicator. I can draw two lines that appear to be straight, and one no. of them is, and one of them isn't. <laughs> no. Okay. They both kind of look straight, but one of them isn't. So that's why we have the square there to represent that it is exactly straight, ninety degrees. But they are the square says they are. Okay. All right. So our eyeball goes to the square on the triangle. The square will not be anything but on the triangle. Now there's two triangles. Sometimes you have two squares. That's fine. The square touches the base and it touches the height. Why is that important? Because how many sides are there of a triangle? How many sides are there? Of a triangle. There's three of them. You see this side? It's labeled 12. Do you see this side? Could there be a number on it? Could there be a number on it? Yes. That number is, I don't know, maybe it's 22. The reason why you got to look for the square is because they could have that distance listed there. That 22 is immaterial. I mean, it's not important to our calculation. Yeah, it's 22. Great. I'm not going to use it for the calculation. Okay. So your eyeball goes to the square because that square touches the base and it touches the height. Maddie, this is where you, you lose it. Okay. The square touches the base and it touches the height. You see this side? It's part of the triangle. It could be 22 centimeters or feet in this case. It's great. It's 22. It's not part of the calculation. The reason why you have to look for the square because the square will tell you what the base and height is. If I didn't have that square there, you wouldn't know what the height was. Okay. All right. We've now found the base and the height of the triangle, 12 and 20. The distance between the two triangles, you see the two triangles, is 25. Three numbers multiplied together, divided by two. Three numbers multiplied together, divided by two. That's what we do. Okay, well, that's easy. Yeah. So we don't do the triangle equation and we do, it's hidden right there. Well, that is the error of the triangle. 12 times 20 divided by 2. Okay. The whole thing, if we add the 25, gives us the volume of the triangle of prism. Okay, who's lost? I'm not joking when I say your eyeball has to go to the square. Yes. Okay. There are two squares, but the triangles are exactly remember. 
It's a prism because both triangles are congruent. They're equal to each other. So you can go to either one. The reason why we didn't go to this square because there's only the height, there's no base listed here. Okay, so I go to the one that has, an, and then when they're really mean to you, they leave that off and they put the base on one of the triangles and the height on the other. Be ready for that. They can do that. There will only sometimes be three numbers like what I'm doing right now. How many numbers are there now? No, you have to identify the right ones. And I only say that because if you don't make that as your habit, you'll just pick any three numbers randomly. Remember, there's a whole lot of edges here. If I list all the distances, you're gonna have lots of numbers. So get into a habit of looking for the square base and height. Maddie, you see the square? What two sides does it touch? How many sides is it touching? What? How do you only see one here? One, two. But does it not touch the square? Agreed. It's the height of the triangle. The square gives you the two numbers that you need to use. Okay, look for the square. All right. What did I do with this one? Instead of it being a tent, I turn it on its side. Now the two triangles are top and bottom. Okay, not that I want to pick on Maddie, but Maddie, where's the square? How many squares do you see? Does everyone look one? Danny, this is your question as well, too. Do you see the two squares? If I look at the bottom square, are there any numbers down here? Okay, it's still the base and the height, but there's no numbers. So go to the other one. Do you see the square on the top triangle? What two numbers does it touch? Four. Maddie? Four and three. That's what you got to do each time. Hey, notice there's a five here. It's not that the five is a wrong number, Nathan. You're not paying any attention. Put the calculator down. Okay. It's not the five is a wrong number. It's just not part of the calculation. Five is the distance of that side of the triangle. But we need the two sides that touch the square, three and four, and then we need the distance between the two triangles. Can you see that the distance between the two triangles is? The distance between the two triangles is? Is eight, okay? So those are the three numbers, three, four, and eight. Uh, Danny was saying, well, if there's only three numbers, clearly I must be multiplying those three numbers. She is correct. You just need to be ready for when there's four numbers or five numbers, or God forbid, if they list every single one, there's going to be nine numbers. Well, then you have to do the stuff that's yeah, but not nine different numbers. Okay? So, but then if you had that, you'd have to pay attention and you'd have to do both of the ones that are touching the, that's square. the square. And that's why. And then the one that's going all the way down correct. the side, or and that, the top, or the other side. Right. That's why I only teach it, let's look for the square. I don't say just take the three numbers because sometimes there can be more. By the way, if it's an equilateral triangle, there might only be two numbers. What's an equilateral triangle? A triangle where, so if I draw an equilateral triangle, all sides are four, there's only going to be two numbers there, four and ten. Right. The only difference on an equilateral triangle, they have to tell you what the height is. So there'll be a, that is usually the one that gets everyone, right? Because there'll be this other dotted line here and it becomes messy. Okay. I don't believe I gave you one for homework, but occasionally you can get one of those. All right. So our three numbers are three, four, and eight. We multiply those together. Uh, the other class are like, wait, where did you get the six and the eight? Well, remember, if you had to do this by hand, you can do the math in any order you want because multiplication is commutative. What I did here was four times three is um, half of 12 is six. That's that's where I got that six from. Other class was a little lost from that. So what you did was you did the triangles with the first out that and then you yeah. yeah. I also could say what's half of eight? Four. Four, four times four is wow. and times three is 48. So you got lots of options there. With a calculator, you're just doing all right, we're back to 10. All right. Uh, do you see it? Uh, by the way, this is an isosceles triangle that, that gives us their two triangles over triangle and prism. Okay. Um, okay, where should your eyeball go? There's only one square. Where are the two numbers that touch it? I, I, to me, this is like I don't understand why some kids can't get this. 
You just look for the square. You find the two numbers. Now the other one, the third number, the distance between the two triangles, sometimes depending upon how they draw the triangle prism, I get why it's a little confusing. So for those of you that have trouble with that, what I always recommend is outline the two triangles, outline the two triangles, and then in your mind's eye, try to figure out how far it is between them. Here's this one, here's this, how far apart are they? They're 12. Danny? Yes. Why did you click? All right, questions on that one. Number nine. So it would be eight times three times 12 divided by two. What did I do here? I get a second 12, eight times three is 24. Half of 24 is 12. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is that it, the formula is not confusing the way people put it in and you, and you, and you might interpret it. Confusing. Well, granted, I mean, I do this every single year, so I, I'm, I'm very well practiced on this, but um, trying to put myself into your place, I believe you get hung up on, well, one, it's, it's a complicated picture drawn in two dimensions. It can flip around on you. So, I mean, the, 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 the key here is, like I said, find the square. The other thing, too, is once again, even though they might have the square here, they have that as three. This bottom part might not have a number. You might have to go hunting for it on the other triangle. The eight could be listed right there and not right there. But it's just a matter of hunting. Okay. Once you do a, a bunch of these, you kind of get a, a sort of good solid feel and you get some, uh, I don't know, practice makes perfect, so to speak. Questions? By the way, here's one like homework. Hey, there's only three numbers. Multiply three numbers. Be careful. That's not true. It's just not take three numbers and multiply them together. Take the correct three numbers, multiply them together, divide by two. All right, do this one. Box 10 all by yourself. Box 10 all by yourself. Mine does not square. It sure it does. Oh, that one doesn't. Oh, mine doesn't either. Why didn't the squares print out? Maybe because I didn't put them. Uh, so the square is right there. Yeah, you're right. There should be a square right here. You can, right? You don't have to, but you can. I don't have any tape. I have staplers. I have two staplers. No tape. Anybody need help? Hey, Maddie. Dude, work. Come on, let's go. If you had both answers there, I wouldn't be saying anything. Work. What do you take for? Me? No, what do I need to take for? Well, like every teacher has to. Well, because they need it. I don't, I'm a math teacher. What do I need to take for? Something breaks. What's going to break that I use that tape would fix? <laughs> glue. Everything. Got gl I have glue. I got a tape that's not going to work either. Okay. What if you have to tell what? I think. You got big problems. I can't be close. My clicker breaks, tape's not going to fix it. I got to buy another clicker. My computer breaks, need a new computer. My projector breaks, tape isn't going to fix it. Yeah, it is. So if the light bulb goes out and burns out, tape will fix it. Yeah, no. I think Thomas Edison is going to have a little problem with you. Who? Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb. Oh, I thought he was the inventor. Uh, if you um, if you want to be more precise, he didn't actually invent the light bulb. What he did is he invented a light bulb that actually worked. The light bulb had been invented, or the idea of what makes a light bulb long before him. What he was able to do uh, was he was able to perfect it. They had light. You haven't been lied to. It's not precise language. 
Uh, Edison Edison didn't invent the light bulb. What he did is, and it took him, I forget how many experiments, but we're talking thousands of them. What, you know how a light bulb actually works? No. Yeah. So when you put electricity, listen, please. When you put electricity through a wire, the electricity flows the wire, right? No. Okay. Yes. Electricity can go through almost anything. Uh, 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 insulators, no. Uh, but uh, as you see with lightning, uh, uh, electricity goes through air even, right? Um, so what happens is when electricity, you're not listening, you're talking. Electricity goes through a wire, right? It encounters some resistance. And what happens is that resistance makes the wire get hot. And as the wire gets hotter and hotter, and this goes for any substance, when, when substances get hot, we're not talking about up 10 degrees, we're talking thousands of degrees. What happens is it tends to glow, right? And what happens is if it gets very hot, the glow changes from a red to an orange, all the way up into a white hot. What happens is that it, as it heats up, it can melt. And what's really happened is there's an interaction between the oxygen in the air and the wire. So what Edison and others did was they figured out that if you took a glass bulb, put a wire inside and do what? Yeah. Yeah. Suck out all the air, right? What happens is that there's no longer oxygen inside there and the wire doesn't burn up. Now he didn't use wire. This is why you don't understand things. Yeah, I do. Like, I really understand. Understand. Okay. You can't listen and have a conversation at the same time. Keep the paper. Okay, stop. Okay. Okay. So what Edison found out is that if instead of using wire, um, uh, wire necessary, although current ones do use wire, um, he used a substance, I want to say it was burnt bamboo. I don't know if that's 100% right, but it's close to that. And it's carbonated. And what he did was he placed a lot of carbon on the wire itself. And that is what produced the longest lasting. There are some light bulbs that Edison made that are still working today. Okay? Really? Right. I bet they're like a billion. No, they're not a billion dollars, but. Uh, How do they not go red when they, they do, but they, they're made in such a way, not all of the Edison, plenty of Edison bulbs have burned out, but there are some Edison bulbs that even work today. Uh, by the way, you know what the bottom is on a light bulb, the little screw thing? Yeah. That is why it's literally called an Edison bulb, because he's the guy that invented. And it, he was not necessarily the inventor. He was the guy like, I don't know, maybe the, our, our modern equivalent would be like Elon Musk. He's the guy that had the company. He did Tesla, SpaceX, right? <laughs> PayPal. Right? Yes, PayPal. He made PayPal? He's the guy that came up with PayPal. No. <laughs> I knew the government had money. Uh, you pay without money. Oh, I knew it. When you go on eBay and you buy something, how do you give the person the money? No. PayPal. PayPal is awesome. All right. All right. Uh, back to here, the two answers. Stop. The two answers here were 240 and 48. Remember the units are cubic feet. All right, have a good day. Uh, are you gonna draw another class when you're supposed to be listening? All right, Eleanor, any questions? Nope. All right, catch you tomorrow. Okay, bye. See ya.